Ryan, what do you think? Time to start? I would say let's kick her off. All right, we'll get going. Okay, so um, thank you, everybody. That's that's joined in on the webinar. Really appreciate uh, tuning in. I think there's probably going to be some valuable things coming from this. And uh, really, this kind of came on the scene here in the last uh, couple weeks as we've gotten a lot of wet weather in the upper Midwest, um, South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, Northwest Iowa. Um, it really started early in the spring. There's going to be some acres that uh, are likely rolled into prevented plants. And then there's some acres that are drowned out now too. Um, and with this being another wet week, um, it's probably still very relevant. So we're going to go through um, uh, all of the options really is, is what we want to cover and the options that uh, you guys can still plant that make sense um, for your operations. Go ahead and turn the slide. There we go. So we'll do a couple of brief interject introductions. Uh, my name is Justin Frichty. My role here at Renovo Seed is the uh, egg product expert. I've been with uh, Millborn for over 13 years now, and so I've worked on the foraging cover crop side. Uh, I live near Pipestone County, Minnesota, just right on the border. We farm. My wife and I do. We have some sheep. We have a cow calf operation. We grow. Uh, grow. We used to grow some grass seed. We don't have that in production anymore. And we really grow uh, feed for our livestock and then farm corn, soybeans, and we have five kids. So we got to update that picture to get a new one up there. Hi, I'm Brian Boyle. I am the sales account manager in the Eastern Dakotas, Iowa, Minnesota, and Northeast Nebraska. Um, I actually worked at Millborn College in the warehouse um, back in the days when Fricky was new. And uh, just came back on board um, to be the account manager. Always had a passion for forages. And uh, we, down in Northwest Iowa by a little town called Washtaw, we run a cow-calf operation, um, mainly selling registered full-blood Simmental and Fleckfee cattle. Uh, do a lot of double crop annual forages, making feed on the acres we have, along with the uh, pasture acres. So it's my family there, Brittany, my wife, me, and then our little girl and boy. Uh, Bristol and Braxton. So. All right. So these next two slides are going to answer probably the two most popular questions when it comes to planting a cover crop or a forage crop on acres that you roll enrolled into prevent and plant. And so you can you can go to the USDA RMA website and you'll see all of the guidelines for um, planting on prevent plant acres and um, harvest restrictions or what used to be harvest restrictions. There's really not anymore in these questions. We'll answer that. So the first one here, um, really it's, it's, it's asking what are my options for planting forage on prevented plant acres? And so you can see option one and option two. Uh, you can plant a forage as a cover crop and you really have to plant a cover crop, which means um, you can't just plant a, uh, a, a, a single species that would be used as a harvestable grain crop is what it's saying. So that cover crop um, can then be hayed, grazed, cut for silage, used for haylage or baleage, and you can harvest it at any time. And that was a change that happened uh, a few years ago and it, that is permanently in place still. And so however you want to manage it, whenever you want to take it for, for grazing or hay, it's completely up to you as long as it is a cover crop um, being used for forage, okay? Um, so the, the, the forage crop, and there is, this, this kind of gets a little bit confusing here. Um, you can plant a forage crop with the following options for number two here. You don't have to insure that forage crop. Obviously, if you plant millet or circumstance grass, you don't ever have to insure it if you don't want to. Um, and then it just, once again, it states there are no planting date or harvest date restrictions. Okay, so um, we're past the 15th of June, which in most areas here in the upper Midwest, especially that's the last planting date for soybeans. Uh, that's passed. So you can go ahead and you can plant circumstance grass or forage sorghum at any time now. Um, and then harvest it at any time now as well, okay? Um, and then it says that the crop is considered a first crop regardless of insurance coverage for the crop year, okay? So it's, it just goes back to that double cropping scenario and how it could affect that cash crop 
Um, if you had intentions of planting corn or soybeans, um, obviously that was your first crop. You enrolled it into Prevent Plant Acres. And so now you're able to plant whatever you would like for a forage or cover crop or cover crop for a forage. And then the next question up here uh, that's very relevant says, I am interested in planting the cover crop after the late planting period to keep the ground cover crop for conservation purposes. I would also like to chop it for silage sometime in the fall. Will that affect my prevented planting payment? And it used to be uh, that if you took this for silage before the first of November, that you were going to be penalized and you're going to have to pay a portion or a percentage of your prevented plant payment. That is no longer a rule. So once again, just like basically what I said earlier, if you want to plant it as a cover crop, but you'd also still like to chop it for silage, you can take it at any time and not have to pay a percentage of your prevent plant payment back. So the gates are really wide open on this now as far as utilizing a forage crop on PP acres, which is extremely nice because you don't have to worry about these restrictions um, and, and penciling it out that way too. All right, Boyle, do you want to go through what are our hay options as far as utilizing uh, these acres, whether it was drown on acres or it's PP acres? Yeah, yep. We'll buzz to this slide and then we'll get into the actual species there. Um, millets, pretty reliable, pretty easy to get established, pretty cheap to put in, economical. Um, Teff grass is a really cool product. Um, we'll talk more about that. That's going to have the best quality, um, probably the best dry down. And then Sudan grasses, we'll talk about later in this presentation. So let's get into the millets. German millet, we, uh, it's one of our most popular millets. It's the one that works good on dry, sandy ground, tougher ground. Um, still pretty good quality. It's easy to get up and get going. A little bit of rain, it makes pretty good, uh, pretty good dry matter. You see her 20, 25 pounds, you know, 65 days, she's ready to go. It is a single cut um, option, but if you're running up against uh, not knowing what to plant, we only got one time to get some hay cut off of it. German millet's a really good option. Um, yeah, as long as you get her up in 60 days before frost, you should be able to get her off. So, yep. White Wonder, um, really popular too. It's very similar to German. It uh, get a little bit taller and a little bit better quality. Guys that have planted it side by side, like the White Wonder and German both, maybe lean a little bit towards White Wonder if they want a little more quality. Um, same scenario there. It's a single cut, uh, 20, 25 pounds an acre. So, Japanese millet. That one is going to be a very hot topic on these wet ground <clears throat> acres. Um, it's a multi cut, it goes good in those likes wet feet, um, can go on alkali ground, uh, yields better than your German and white wonder um, possibly could be just a little bit harder to dry down obviously because it likes wet feet than German or white wonder. But if you got a little bit low potholy ground, this one will outdo German and white wonder in that scenario. Um, that's one if you got a little drowned out area, I think it's gonna take a little bit to get it just barely fit enough to go. This is gonna be a very good option for that. But um, see it a little bit thicker, um, but it's going to be a good option as well. So, and you have the chance of, uh, getting uh, a little bit more tonnage out of it, but just be aware that this could be a little bit harder to dry down. So. And really that's probably not because of the stem thickness, but because of the windrow is just big. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's even in a single cut, Japanese is taller than German or white wonder. So you're going to have a higher yielding crop, even in one cutting. Plus, you're going to get regrowth and get a second cutting. So it does yep. yield a whole heck of a lot of millet hay. Yep. Pearl millet. We have our new hay max, and this one we're really excited about, too. This pearl millet, it's the one you want to put on your best ground if you got an option to put it on. Um, it's a multi-cut. Works good in hay and grazing scenarios. So if you want to take one cutting of hay and then uh, graze that second one, um, works really, really good, good quality. Um, 
make sure you leave a little stubble growth though. Like we have in our note down here. So you get your tillering coming back fast and you don't get your growing point. A um, little bit lighter seeding rate, but it's, uh, we've had a lot of success with pearl millets. So, and it's, so it's, it's cost per pound is more, but your lower seeding rate does pull back your cost per acre. I mean, it's still going to be the most, it's the highest cost per acre millet to plant. Um, but it actually doesn't get that much more expensive because you're lowering the population that you're seeding. Yeah. And I would say it definitely pays for itself. You know, the extra money you put into that acre on pearl millet, you will get your tonnage back out of it. So Tef grass, that is uh, very popular too. And one thing I will note about this, like say a guy, maybe you got a little more nitrogen down on that acres and you're worried about nitrates and some of your other millet products. Um, Tef grass tends to have less nitrate issues on something that's had been fertilized before. So it's a really fine seed, um, low seeding rate, 10 pounds an acre. It's hard to get <laughs> air to the side of caution when you start seeding it to get your drill set. But it is a very high quality. If you can get it put upright, um, you can get a couple, three cuttings out of it before it frosts off. It's got a very shallow root. Um, you don't really want to graze it until you're ready for it to be gone. Um, if you graze it, you're going to pull it out by the roots. And, uh, but if you can get the hay put up right, it's got great protein. Um, we put a little bit in in a plot at my place last year, and it was running 17% protein. Um, it was very good. So, Would you use um, coated or uncoated TEF seed to plant? I, I used coated, and that's what we recommend. Coating helps you get your uh, – it's coated with some lime, helps you with some metering, and then – um that helps with establishment as well so it uh it's such fine seed it's almost like sand it'll run right out of your drill so just and one main thing to know about tef too is the establishment it likes very shallow planting if you can't see some on top you probably got it too deep and uh firm ground and if you can roll it or pack it in just don't get it too deep um eighth inch is ideal on that seeding depth. So, and you wanna try to get it cut before the seed heads start coming out, you'll get a better regrowth and it won't kill the stand on that one. So, horse people love to buy teff hay. So if you got a uh, way to make some small square bales, you can probably make some money selling teff grass hay. <laughs> uh, sedan grass, we're gonna go through some of our uh, Oh, I don't think we have straight sedan grass. So we do sell uh, Piper sedan grass, um, highest yielding hay option. It's a little coarser. It is a multi-cut. Um, so it's going to take a couple days extra to dry, but it does put some tonnage out there. But like our pro tip, have a backup plan because it might lay there for six, seven days and you might still have to make baleage too if you can't get it down dry enough. Uh, 20 pounds an acre. Yeah. That's really, uh, it depends on where you live. I mean, if you're in Western South Dakota, you're used to putting up sorghum sedan grass for hay all the time. You can get it done because it can lay out there for 10 days and, and no problem. When we move East and you get into some humidity, boy, this guy's really, really tough to actually cure out correctly. Yeah. Make sure when you, you got a crimper, got her crimp it and break that stem open to get her exposed to get some dryness but it is a good option it uh it turns hot and dry it doesn't affect this near as much and it can handle that kind of stress so all right now we're moving more into our silage options if you have the capability and want to make some uh Cheap tonnage there. Um, we got some forage sorghums, uh, single cut, different varieties. Uh, does develop a grain head. Um, usually we like to get those grain heads to uh, soft dough about halfway down that seed head before we cut. And that'll usually get you to your right moisture without wilting. Um, and then we do have some longer maturity options. And then uh, sorghum sedan grass, then you can get your multi-cut um, silage options is where uh, we got some BMRs in there as well, uh, finer stems, and then you have the option of hating or grazing. 
Soramax 85. This is a very good product. Um, it's an 85 day uh, BMR, a little bit shorter stature, but still does a lot of tonnage, a lot of leaves. Um, it works really good in some of these double crop rotations as well. Like you got a little triticale came off, you plug this in right behind it or rye. Um, we can still get this in here the next week or two and still have the opportunity to get it to maturity before frost and take a direct cut. Um, you know, if you're drilling or planting, it works pretty good at that lower seeding rate. If you're going to broadcast it, maybe bump the pounds up to get a good establishment. Um, we've seen it work in anything from 30 inch rows to drilling it to slinging it out there and packing it in a half inch deep. So half to three quarter inch, put it in the ground and it'll come out good. Um, yeah, like I said, if you can get it to soft dough on that seed head about halfway down on your seed head, you usually get into that 30% dry matter to 35%, you can get it put up good with a good inoculant. So stands good. It's a really popular product. Yeah, and a lot of people, you know, complain about putting up salad or sorghum for silage because it's usually wet and sometimes it gets late in the year. And now those complaints are, are typically coming because of a long day late maturing forage sorghum. And so, uh, you know, we used to have a product called Bunker Buster and, and, and it turns out Bunker Buster was more like a hundred day. And that was one of the earliest ones that, that last two years of guys using this at, they've they've absolutely loved it they're cutting it you know around the, the 10th of september when they're chopping corn silage and it just fits right in with you know getting a custom crew out to chop at the same time and your pile is actually uh firmed up and not a mushy mess either mm -hmm. yeah and you know you're still pulling good tons off this sormax 85 too you know it's it's a good product and usually that sorghum silage is 85% of the uh, energy content of corn silage. Well, if a guy's feeding some cows or something or has the capability of other products to mix in with it, it's a very economical choice to put up a big pile of feed on acres that weren't going to make corn anyways. So, The Sormax 100, this is a little bit longer. Um, we'll get a little taller, has potential to get Maybe a few more tons out of that Sormax 100, but it's it might need to get frosted and let it dry down just a touch to uh, get her to take direct cut, or you might have to let her wilt to get to your proper uh, um, moisture content to make a good pile. Um, it is a BMR as well. Uh, it's If you have the capability, if you own your own chopper or something, and you're not worried about trying to get somebody in there on time and they aren't going to be busy doing something else, this might put up a little bit more tons, but it's also a good option. So. You want to take the cow conditioner, Frickney? You bet. So we'll roll into the sorghum sedan options and really a, a sorghum sedan grass. You know, we've talked about forage sorghum. We've talked about Piper sedan grass, and these are hybrid crosses. And so it, it, they really kind of give you the flexibility of both. Um, most of the time, we'd probably still recommend chopping these. But like I said earlier, you know, if, if you live in, in the Western Dakotas, you're probably pretty um, used to baling sorghum sedan grass and, and, and putting these up as dry hay. Um, they do regrow, which is different than a forage sorghum. And so this time of year, it's something that we could put in, um, you know, we, we could chop it early and then probably still catch a little bit of heat the last half of September, early October before it freezes and then graze that regrowth. And so, if, you know, if, if logistically it made sense in that field, this might be a better option than forage sorghum. Um, they're much earlier, you know, this cow conditioner, it's a 70 day maturity. And so we do have plenty of time to get this one in. It's a BMR and, and we didn't quite describe exactly what the BMR trade is, but really it's, it's brown midrib, which it, it reduces the amount of lignin or cellulose in the stalk and the leaves of the plant. And so a, a cow is able to eat more of it because she's able to break down that fiber more or faster. And so if they're breaking it down faster in the rumen, 
that rumens get in emptier quicker and they can eat more which increases gains typically so um we like the bmrs always for grazing because they're more palatable too but even if you're chopping it that sorghum silage is more digestible and better quality feed too that's a picture of the cow conditioner uh absolutely beautiful sorghum sedan grass really leafy stands great We've had this product for a long time, and it's it's been one of our mainstays in our warm season annual forage lineup. RS forty five hundred. Um, so we needed another BMR sorghum sedan grass to offer in our lineup, and that's that's just what this is. It's it's slightly different. Um, you know, it's a little bit more economical than our branded cow conditioner. Um, but if you want a BMR sorghum sedan grass. Um, you know, this, this RS4500 will, will be just that for you. So RS9000, uh, this is our conventional sorghum sedan grass. We have it raw. So if you're an organic producer or you don't want any seed treatments on that seed, you'd want to lean towards RS9000. It is not BMR. Um, and so we've even had people use this as like a plow down crop on PP acres where maybe you don't even want to use forage, but you know you, you want to grow something out there as quick as possible and as cheap as possible, and you're just going to work it under in the fall. Actually, this is a bit for that too. Um, because it's such an economical seed to do that with, um, it'll, it'll at least get you some ground cover, suppress some weeds, um, maybe soak up any nitrogen that would have otherwise leached through the profile. You could use it that way. But it still makes feed. You can still chop it. Um, it's still going to get you a lot of feed in about that 70, 75 day range. Boy, why don't you talk through uh, the grazing cover crop mixes that we have? Yep. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about a couple options we have here. Um, you know, if you base your operation around corn stock grazing, and well, if there won't be near as many acres, these things are worth real well as. Uh, Grazing once and then stockpiling them for later. Um, get them in on time now, and you can get a lot of good quality tonnage out of it with high quality feed. And it does good for uh, um, soil health as well. Um, we do these mixes to get the right uh, dry matter intake levels. Um, you know, one of those two is we uh, recommend too when you fresh turn out, maybe have them full going out to it as well. Um, you can use less grass in mixes of planting corn in 2025. We have something that'll work on everything. So premium graze. This one works really well on your, uh, where you get moisture and kind of towards the east here. Uh, produces a lot of great tonnage. Cows love it. Um, you know, you get it in and by the time it gets up, you know, knee high, maybe you can start grazing there. And if you do a good job rotating, um, you know, about a cow an acre, it seems like you can kind of get through there and uh, give it some time to rest. And it works good in a situation where you can let it get some regrowth. And then into late fall, after uh, some other pastures have run out, you can turn them back into there for a stockpile forage. You can plant this a little lighter seeding rate than uh, ranch hand at 15 pounds an acre. Um, you know, the uh, turnips and the radishes and brassicas, they hold their nutrient value pretty good late into the year. And actually those uh, cows, once they figure out how to eat those turnips, they just love them. So um, it's a really good option. Has that uh, warm season annuals in it that can hold up to a little bit of the heat and stuff coming through late summer. And then you'll get a good fall flush out of it as well. So. The ranch hand, that was one uh, that's been developed here at Millbourne as well, uh, Renovo. Um, works good and uh, works good everywhere, but it can handle the tough conditions as you move further west. Um, very versatile. Um, just everybody that's planted it has loved it. There isn't enough good things to say about it. It always takes good pictures. Actually, the first picture on this uh, slideshow was actually ranch hand. That was, you know, scoop shovel high or dirt shovel high. So. Um, if you're worried about getting enough rainfall and stuff, if you're in a little drier, hotter climate, ranch hand is a good option. So seed that a little thicker, 20 pounds drilled, and you'll have good luck with it. So, All right. So that kind of concludes everything that we'd recommend 
on the forage side, you know, haying, chopping, and grazing mixes, and what we'd use that way. But if you don't have livestock to graze, you don't need to put up forage, um, and your acres are just sitting bare, we probably want to still get something out there. Um, so things to think about here is definitely the timeline. As we put these cover crops in, um, just know that they get big if they're planted now. And I, I, I really mean that about brassica species and so we'll go through some mixes like a, a nutrient builder mix but if you plant the nutrient builder mix right now and you have radishes in that blend and you live in northwest iowa on pattern tiled fields more than like you're probably going to see some issues with tile lines getting some roots in them okay if your field's not tiled then it, it doesn't matter so much you can go ahead and plant it and get as much growth as you want um, but because those those species have the potential to do that I would hold off, wait till the end of July, and then go ahead and plant those on those specific acres, okay? Um, also know that brassica species are pretty daylight uh, sensitive, and so they'll really, um, they, if you plant them before summer solstice, which is mid-July, it's going to want to go reproductive and make seed. However, if you wait till after summer solstice, they'll stay vegetative, They'll put more energy in de developing that deep tap root like we want, and they won't bolt and flower and make volunteer seed. Okay, that's that's on the brassica species. So think about the timeline on how big or how much growth or how much seed we want these plants to actually produce if we're not going to use them for forage. The other thing to think about is how are we going to agronomically offset the diversity within our crop rotation? All right, so. If these acres are going to go back to corn in 2025, let's not plant a field of sorghum sedan grass as a cover crop, all right? It's going to be way similar to that corn plant. You're going to probably harbor uh, pathogens and really be a green bridge to that. Um, and it's going to be a high carbon species that likes to tie up a lot of nitrogen ahead of corn where you don't want that to happen. So um, use offsetting crop types ahead of next year's cash crop is what I'm saying. And then the management of this is the other thing that I think is smart to think about. And really it is, uh, it, it's about sticking with your, your system that you're already in. And, and it probably comes down to like your, your tillage system and your planting system that you're already in. Um, so I, don't start no-tilling, you know, next year after you plant a cover crop, if you've, if you've traditionally been in a, in a tillage system. All right, let's 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 try not to add too many layers to this system. Um, so if you typically are in a no-till system, we can develop a cover crop blend that works well and breaks down easy to go ahead and no-till into, all right? Same can be said about uh, a, a tillage system. If you typically do follow tillage to set up your corn planting that next spring, let's make sure that we can get through this cover crop um, with a strip till machine uh, or whatever it may be that you're using in the fall. Um, and so the, the cover crop should be developed around that. And we've got, you know, I think we have eight different mixes on hand all the time. And, and those can all work within those parameters as well. So by far and away, the most popular blend that we use on prevented plant acres ahead of corn is Nutrient Builder. And the reason why is it's not going to create a whole lot of residue uh, we don't have any warm season grasses in here uh, ahead of corn, and, and we've got legumes to fix nitrogen. And so the legumes in here are the vetch, the clover, the sun hip, and the peas. And ideally, we'd get them growing and, and fix as much nitrogen to offset any additional nitrogen that we need to use. And so if we've got the opportunity, we just as well build it. And so then we'll have that, the deep taproot of the radishes to increase water infiltration, open up that ground from any compaction issues as well. We like flax in there as a broadleaf species that's really mycorrhizal friendly. And we do use that in a lot of our cover crop blends because of that. Uh, and then it's a nice sturdy standing broadleaf species that works great no-till systems to catch a little snow too. And the same can be said about the old seals are, are great at just getting you a little bit of quick ground cover. You won't see a lot of them out there in this blend, but it's nice to just have a little bit of the grass for that. So you'll, you, yeah, I would definitely recommend nutrient builder, plant it late July, early August, and then uh, plant corn on those acres in 2025. So as far as, uh, and, and, and what are the actual possibilities? 
So this, this graph here shows each species and the full potential of N in pounds per acre produced. When I look at this, I think that's huge. I think how in the heck can we ever get 220 pounds of nitrogen produced from bursine clover? And, and really what it's saying, if you planted bursine clover in the spring as its single crop, you know, you have the potential to actually make up to 220 pounds per acre and above and below ground nitrogen. Okay, so I show this slide just to show you the possibilities of what we can be doing with these cover crops and why it is important to have a legume in these mixes. We actually can get some real nitrogen fix out of these. Um, you know, in, in years where we're using cover crops after a small grain harvest comes off and, and we're pushing time, we don't actually get these cover crops to flower and, you know, hit full maturity. It gets a little tougher to, or to actually expect a lot of nitrogen produced. But in a year like this, where we're going to get them planted fairly early, um, just know that we can actually cut some expensive nitrogen that following year for our cash crops. And this, this table here really shows uh, when we expect that nitrogen release or how uh, when we can expect it to actually be there. And obviously, whatever we plant, there's going to be a percentage of nitrogen uh, or protein and then nitrogen from any species growing, uh, e even grasses included. Um, but just know that at that flowering stage, um, that's really when we're going to get the most nitrogen produced and, and returned back into our system. And then also the, the bottom note there, you know, 50% of nitrogen from plants will be available next year if it's worked into the soil. If we don't work it into the ground, yeah, you're going to lose some of it just from volatilization of it not being buried into your soil. Uh, I'm not saying you have to work it in your ground, but that's just really how we, we've got to capture that nitrogen within that plant somehow. All right, so if we're going back to beans, um, really, we, we really like these rye cocktails. And we've already had a lot of questions uh, about utilizing rye on prevented plant acres. Um, it's early, okay? I'll just say that right now. It's, it's early to plant rye. It's gonna act a little different if you plant it in the summer versus in the fall. It's going to get fairly tall. It's gonna stay vegetative because rye is a winter annual. And if it doesn't go through a cold cycle or vernalization process, it's not gonna go reproductive. So if you plant it in June, July, early August, it's gonna get probably about a foot tall. And as that plant stretches and elongates, it actually hurts its winter hardiness. So next year, it's probably gonna be dead. So we really like to wait until fall or after the middle of August to start utilizing rye. And so, it, you know, depending on what you're looking for out of these acres and how wet they stay, just understand that um, it may or may not fit your system or, or what, you know, what ground you're trying to cover. Um, but it just might, depending on how wet we stay. But typically, ahead of soybeans, we really like these rye cocktails. And we've got three of them that we use all a little bit differently. That Mellow Maker is our radish, churn up, rapeseed mixed with rye. All American is crimson clover, uh, winter camelina, and radishes, radishes mixed with rye. And then winter wonder is hairy vetch, winter camelina and rye all bunded together. But ahead of, uh, ahead of soybeans, it's definitely gonna suppress weeds because of that rye in there. So the other point to, to make note of is just managing that. You know, So like I said, some people wanna plant it right now and that's, that's okay. Just know that it may or may not be there next spring. It's really, really hard to tell how the plant's going to exactly work. Um, but if it's planted after August, more than likely it's going to come back next spring. And um, with your soybean system, a lot of people will plant soybeans directly into that green stubble of rye that's actively growing. And then they'll come back with their pre and their burn down to kill that rye and then allow those soybeans to come in there. We're not huge uh, promoters of using rye ahead of your corn crop. You know, it goes back to that agronomic um principle of making sure that you're using offsetting crop types and rye and corn are very similar. And the fact that they're grasses, they both love nitrogen early and they're going to be antagonistic against one another. And so make sure that if next year's intended crop on those acres is corn, let's, let's not use a lot of rye there. Um, 
And then obviously whatever that, whatever we do have for growth out there in the spring, more than likely you're going to have to manage. And so we, we got to get out there fairly timely and make sure that we've got good growing days when we're spraying off that ride to kill it correctly. So with that, uh, we'd certainly entertain any questions. Um, feel free to unmute yourself, holler them out, or we can put them in that chat and we'll read them off. Um, and that's our contact information there, our phone number here to the line, and then both of our email addresses as well. There was one thing I wanted to add to Fricky on the uh, the grazing cover crop options there as well is uh, when you're grazing them, when it's time to get them off of there, if you're looking for some regrowth, don't graze it too short to the ground. Um, you're going to hurt some regrowth on those summer annuals. And then also as well, before turning them out, if it gets really big and tall, um, you're going to have some more waste than if you get them in there on time. So um, just one thing I wanted to add there, I didn't add at first. So. Um, do you want to go to that last slide there, Laura? The most exciting thing that we've got coming up at Renovo Seeds is we are doing a field day plot day uh, with some speakers as well. And uh, it's coming up July 2nd. And so uh, renovoseed.com backslash plot, or if you just go to our website, you'll see a link on top of the page um, to register for this. We'd love to have you come out. We've got plots across the road from our warehouse here. And it's got forage barley, it's got triticale, we've got forage oats, we've got peas and oats, we've got all of our warm season annual forages that we talked about growing on there. We've got our cover crop mixes, we've got experimentals of all those as well. And so you're going to get a chance to go through those plots and then also take in any of the speakers. And so uh, Graham Finn from Canada is coming down. He's going to talk through uh, 365 days of grazing. I'm going to speak on practical and profitable solutions with crop rotations. Jared's not going to... Jared Nock is going to talk about incentive programs for forage production. And Dr. Lee Breeze is going to talk about um, practical uh, agronomy use of cover crops as well. We'll have a free lunch at noon. Uh, we'll give tours of the warehouse. It should be a great time. We'll have a big tent set up. And so it, it, it'll be a blast. And you'll get to see a lot of really cool things in the plot as well. So please come to that. Were there any other questions that, that you all have on... On the, on the presentation. Brian, do you have anything to add? No, just, uh, you know, we're here for uh, any of the questions you have later on too. And if there's certain scenarios you, uh, need to work through with guys, you know, we're always here. Give us a call and we can try to get something that'll match up to optimize those acres. So, um, yeah, hopefully.